public. And, uh, uh, Minister, I'm glad to speak on this motion. We know that energy prices have risen across Europe, and that's not in question. But there are very particular factors here in Ireland, and Bloomberg indeed is reporting that the biggest monthly gains of electricity costs are in Dublin, where power rates have climbed 44%. So similarly, the cost of gas and other fuels is going up and up. We can no doubt attribute this anomaly to climate change, and there's no doubt about that. Uh, this, is one of, uh, this is an anomaly. Uh, unseasonably warm weather, uh, this anomaly, uh, which, while it has a sinister cause, has certainly meant, uh, in positive terms, that fewer people in Ireland have had to turn on heating so far. But as we, see a down, uh, as we see a downturn in the temperature, even just today, I think we're going to see those rising costs having an even greater impact on households uh, than up till now, uh, as, as the cold begins to bite. And indeed, I'm already hearing, as I know we all are, about the fear that many families and individuals are facing as they look at the winter ahead and as they see price increases to continue. On Saturday, I addressed a protest organised by the Cost of Living Coalition in my own constituency in Rathmines, and I spoke there with students, with older people, with renters and many others, describing to me the increasingly narrow margins that they experience in order to get by week after week. Uh, and that's a real issue across the country. Now, undoubtedly, the terrible war being waged by Russia against Ukraine has had a significant effect on energy prices uh, across Europe and worldwide. But it does feel as if here in Ireland we're being held to ransom by energy giants and market speculators. And while households here are resilient and they're looking to where they can cut costs and indeed cut energy consumption with a climate focus as well, uh, we can see that it's not additional discretionary spending which drives hardship in Ireland. Uh, it's, it's the cost of, of basic necessities which is uh, driving hardship. And that is costs of housing, of rent, of childcare, and of, co of course costs of energy. And even where we all seek to reduce energy consumption, as I know we're all doing, we're still seeing really uh, drastically rising prices in energy and we're all hearing these issues and there are many people who cannot manage without uh, without uh, um, continued levels of heating and continued levels of energy uses so vulnerability to market factors have contributed to the hardship people are in and a change of system and radical measures is what are needed now to help not the sort of band-aid solutions or half measures that we saw introduced in budget 2023 so while one-off measures like the lump sum payments did assist people for a while their initial shine is starting to wear off because once energy credits and lump sum payments are used up we know prices are going to continue to rise and social protection recipients are receiving payments below the rate of inflation and poverty and deprivation are likely to go up as temperatures drop. So it's past time that we saw an end to the undue deference to profit and to profit driven companies when it comes to securing the well-being of our people. A profit motive is fundamentally inconsistent with supporting people through periods such as this and we do need to see a strengthening of the role of the state and the intervention of the state in the markets. So to be constructive, what did we propose to avoid some of this and to, re to reduce reliance on the private sector and on the market? Labour in this budget would have implemented a three-pronged approach to the energy crisis with a windfall tax and excess excess profits, a cap on energy prices and changes to the fuel allowance and other energy supports. First, we have no hesitation in pushing further for the principle of a windfall tax on profits and a solidarity tax, and we conservatively estimated our iteration of a windfall levy would have, would have, would yield, uh, would have yielded £600 million in 2022, rising to €800 million Euro in 2023. Secondly, the cap on energy prices, which the government has resisted, saying it's a complex and dynamic measure. Certainly it is, but we've seen many EU countries taking this approach, and we pushed for the so-called Iberian model introduced by socialist governments in Spain and Portugal, which has provided a model for limiting the price of gas and electricity production and, in effect, subsidising gas generators. They've adopted that model since June, and they've reduced bills for Spanish and Portuguese households by between 15 and 20 per cent. Here in Ireland, we've also called for the temporary nationalisation of the Corrib gas field, and I renew that call today, Minister, so that the price that we in Ireland would pay for this dom domestic gas supply would be set at the cost of production plus a margin for the operator, rather than seeing the price set by the market the international market as at present. This is not a cap on fuel prices, but such a measure would serve to regulate and indeed reduce costs for households and can be achieved using existing legislation, as I've said repeatedly in this House, legislation invoked uh, by previous government in the 1970s during the fuel crisis then. 
Alongside those measures, we would have put in place a range of targeted supports through Budget 2023 to help cover uh, those over one million households we know to be at risk of energy poverty. Uh, we would have, refund we would have uh, created a refundable carbon tax credit targeted at ordinary working families in poorly insulated homes, and we would have also uh, ensured that a credit would, uh, this credit would be worth €800 Euro in total to low- and middle-income workers, in particular for families who remain reliant on solid fuel and home heating oil in advance of retrofitting measures. This would have made a significant difference. It's hard to escape the conclusion now, without these sort of targeted measures, that a mini-budget may well be required in the new year to account for the increasing inflation rate and increasing prices, particularly, as I say, in energy and in, fu uh, uh, in fuel. At the very least, we think government could have taken other measures that might have avoided that necessity. For example, a clawback mechanism of some sort for our existing energy credit system, such as the withdrawal of income tax credits from those earning over €100,000, which we also called for, and a levy equivalent to the electricity credit to be applied to holiday and vacant housing, modelled on the previous non-principal private resident charge, to avoid those with multiple properties benefiting from universal measures. Now, we in Labour do staunchly advocate for universal measures where necessary and of benefit, but this is a situation where targeting should have taken place. No one should benefit disproportionately when some are suffering so disproportionately. And when I speak with, co with individuals and with groups who are disproportionately harmed, I want to restate our call for more effective reliefs for people who consume energy on a pay-as-you-go basis. I think we're all conscious that they are particularly affected. People on lower incomes are overrepresented in this group and are least insulated from price hikes. Uh, just like the eviction bill, there should be a guarantee set in stone, Minister, that no one's lights or power will be switched off because they cannot afford to pay this winter. And another group struggling this winter, and, about, and from whom I have heard uh, in many cases, is people, those who are in district heating schemes. And you will know, Minister, this group pays for energy at the commercial rate. I heard from one individual in my own constituency whose bill has risen by nearly 600%, an extraordinary price hike. And I know there are others living in hundreds of apartment blocks around the country uh, who are also affected. I submitted a parliamentary question very recently on this, and the Minister for Climate, in response, mentioned a steering group, which is to report on the matter. Uh, this is really un, uh, you know, an unsatisfactory response for those who are facing bills in excess of €1,000 this winter, and we need to see more urgent action taken. And we're also calling on government to examine as a matter of urgency the regulation of energy companies' use of standing charges to offset the artificial price reduction brought about by the energy credit scheme. We know some suppliers are charging now nearly €1,000 a year in standing charges, regardless of how much energy households or buildings use, or, or, or household, households or businesses use. Hiking charges is anathema to the message we should be sending, asking people to reduce their use of unnecessary energy and switching to renewable sources. So, Minister, I'm asking you to revisit the government's decision on this. All of this comes against a backdrop, of course, as I said earlier, of increasingly visible effects of climate change and, as we, as we see, a debate ongoing at COP27 in Egypt. And yet we see Ireland still among the highest levels of emitters per person. Uh, we see our, our, our system remaining highly reliant on fossil fuel energy, and we do need to see radical measures introduced, Minister, to to ensure a move to renewables and really to see a ramping up of uh, actions necessary to combat climate change. And I look forward to continuing that aspect of the debate Thanks, during Jeffrey. the debate on the new Climate Action Plan. Thanks,